Amy Stegmeyer with Stonemeyer Games, and thank you for joining me for this week's weekly livecast from Stonemeyer Games. Uh, a lot of redundancy there in the, in the introduction. Um, so I post these videos, or I'm live on, on Facebook for one hour every week starting at 10 a.m. Central Time, and then I post them on YouTube afterwards. So if you missed the live stream and you have other questions that you want to ask, go over to the YouTube channel, and I'm happy to answer your questions there. I have a variety of little kind of fun topics today to talk about. Uh, let me start, I guess, with, Sto well, no, I'll wait till people get here for some Stonemaier Games news. There's not a lot of news, but I have a few little things I can share. Um, I did finally try indoor rock climbing again this past week. After taking a long break during COVID, uh, I, I waited for our gym to, to have all the possible safety precautions back in place. And I gave it a try last week twice um, because the first time did feel really safe. It's an indoor rock climbing gym where um, everyone is required to wear masks while they're climbing, covering both their, their nose and their mouth, for, fortunately, which does not seem to be the case in all areas where people wear masks. And uh, there's plenty of uh, hand sanitizer, <clears throat> and um, they limit the number of people in there. So I'm picking like weird time slots during the day where there's only like five people in this entire giant rock climbing gym. So I had fun doing that, um, and I hope to return again this week. So I'm wondering, have you tried doing that? Have you tried stepping out of your, your bubble a little bit, but in safe, safe ways um, to, to experience some things that you haven't been able to do for a long time during the pandemic? And actually, another example of that was this past weekend, this past Saturday, a friend hosted a very small game gathering, which was all outside. We wore masks. It was under a tent. It wasn't too hot, but it was nice to have a little tent. Um, and it felt very safe again, especially since everyone wore their masks, except for when they were eating or drinking, and then they stepped away from the table to do that. We played Space Base, which was great to play that. We played uh, Quacks of Quinlanburg, and we played Pendulum. So all simultaneous games where players are doing things simultaneously. And it was awesome. All three games flowed really, really well. And we had a great time playing them. So let me jump over to the see if there's any questions here. Nope, no questions yet. Oh, here's one. Micah says, what's my favorite thing about Charterstone? Um, ooh, that's tough. Hmm, I think, well, I, I, my favorite component in Charterstone, and it ties to a mechanism, are the building cards. So the idea that you have these cards where you can pull a sticker off of it, put it on the board permanently to impact the growth of your charter, but also that that, that card itself still means something afterwards, and that the card, uh, you can use that card to unlock a crate, to unlock new material, new components, add new components to the game. Um, I don't think that has been used in maybe any other games or maybe only very, very few because I think Panda, our manufacturer, bought a special machine just to make those cards. And uh, I think it's pretty cool. I think it's, I think it's a neat thing. You don't quite experience that in the digital version, but the digital version does add like sound effects and excitement whenever you open a new crate. Um, so I think that's a nice implementation for the, the digital version. Mike, have you played, have you played both versions, the tabletop and the, the digital version of Charterstone? Mike says, am I sore from climbing after taking all that time off? I, yes. After the first time, I wasn't all that sore. I was really careful, and I wasn't sore the first time. And so I went back only two days later. Usually I wait a week between climbing. I probably should have done that. But uh, I was definitely sore after the second time that I went. The one thing, though, that's nice about this is that, you know, I'm being super careful. I, I, I don't want to hurt my fingers after being away for so long. So I'm using my feet a lot more than uh, – than, that I'm used to. So I'm focusing a lot more on technique. And I, that's ultimately a good thing. Like you, you want to use your feet and your legs as much as you can while climbing rather than like dangling from your fingertips. So, um, so that's a good thing, I think, as, I, as I'm keeping an eye on this. I'm trying to be careful about that. Wayne says, I wasn't sure about Pendulum at first, but I'm starting to enjoy it. Any thoughts on possible expansions? I'm glad you're enjoying it, Wayne, or starting to enjoy it. Um, any thoughts about, well, I have talked a little bit with Travis before the release of the game, not recently, about possible expansions regarding probably more asymmetry or more um, more asymmetric factions in the game or characters. So that would be the approach that we would probably take if we expanded the game a little bit. But we'll see. That's uh, up to Travis, up to kind of the success of the game. And uh, so we'll, we'll take that one step at a time. Currently, we don't have anything in the works. David says that he just finished Clank Legacy, or he just finished game eight of Clank Legacy, a wonderful, wonderful legacy game. Matt says, knowing that you love the Red Rising novel series, have you ever listened to the audiobook? I have, yeah, I've listened to the, the first three books um, in audio format. And the, the narrator is really, really good. Whoever, whoever does the, the audiobook, I think, did a really good job. 
Patrick says, I'm getting Twilight Imperium 4 soon. What is your tip for starting to teach people something so big? I've only played Twilight Imperium once, so I don't know if I can speak, well, I definitely can't speak specifically to how to teach that game in particular. But um, for any game that I teach, I try to explain a few core mechanisms, and then I try to get people taking turns as, as quickly as possible, even if that means that I'm guiding them through their first few turns. Um, so if you know Twilight Imperium really well and you're trying to teach people, I think that might, might be one way to do it. For a game like Twilight Imperium, though, you might also want to recommend that people watch a video in advance. So maybe find, um, you know, a 10-minute rules video, which will not explain all the rules of Twilight Imperium, but it will at least give people some, some of those core ideas so that they can start playing uh, rather than sitting through a long, long rules explanation for, for such an epic game like that. So that's one thing that I've done in the past, too. Sent a video to people in the, and said, you know, if you can, watch this before we play. And then as we start to play, I guide them through their first few turns. That's often how I teach Stomeyer games to people. Patrick says, what power did the Lear bird get in the Oceania expansion? I don't know offhand, Patrick. I don't have the birds memorized. Um, Hopefully it's pretty cool. It might be in the appendix um, because all the bird abilities are explained in the appendix and the rule book is available now. So we have now, this is I, I guess the one update compared to last Wednesday. We have a, revealed everything that's in Wingspan Oceania, including the rule book and the appendix, which includes all birds in the game, as well as the Automa rule book. So if you are curious to see exactly what's in this game, you can go back and look at the various design diaries. You can look at the photos. Really everything's depicted in photos on the Stomeyer Games website. Um, the Wingspan Oceania page there, as well as links to the rulebook. So you can go check that out now. And uh, we have so far good news about freight shipping. I wasn't exactly sure how that news would go, but um, it does look like the freight shipment for, um, for the U.S. at least will arrive a little bit after the planned pre-order date of October 28th, which is fine. It's just a few days later. And the other ones, the ones going to Canada and the UK and Australia, look like they are arriving in advance. I am checking on Canada right now. I don't know. I'm checking on Australia right now. So I'm not exactly positive about that. But the rest of them look pretty good. I think Canada did look like maybe a, an early November date as well. So it's possible we'll, we'll bump the pre-order date back by a week. But it's also helpful for fulfillment centers if we give them a little time um, before between pre-orders and when they actually start shipping, even if it's just a few days. Grace says, if you and some friends were stuck on a, de a deserted island with only one board game, which would you pick? There are a couple different ways that I could approach this. I think I've answered this in various ways in the past. Uh, one is I would pick a game that could actually help us survive on the island. One that is maybe highly combustible that we could use to start fires and things like that. Maybe one that's edible. I don't know if there are any edible games out there. But um, I think the idea that you're trying to portray here is what game can we play over and over again and continue to have a lot of fun with? And there are a few endlessly replayable games, in my opinion, that I've, that I've experienced. Um, and many of them, but they're, they're oftentimes the games that are on my top 10 list. Games like Terra Mystica, Tzolkin, uh Castles of Mad King Ludwig, Clank. I can play those games over and over again and not get tired of them. So any of those games, I think, would be eligible for a game on an island. One other consideration on an island, though, is you don't want a game that the pieces can blow around a lot. So I might pick a game that plays well outdoors. That was something I thought about this past weekend when I was bringing games to this outdoor game day. I brought almost all tile laying games. I brought uh, Spirits of the Forest. I brought uh, Blockus, Azul Summer Pavilion, Glen. Uh, did I bring Glenmore? No, I brought uh, Isle of Sky. Isle of Sky has tiles and no cards. And then Project L and Small World of Warcraft which I don't think has any cards. I think those are all games that just have tiles. And then, of course, we didn't play any of those games. We played games with cards and lots of little bits and pieces and ended up being fine. It wasn't too windy. I'll come back to other questions in a second. Let me see if I have... Okay, yeah, some of the topics I, I've been writing about or, or making videos about recently. This My video this past week was about games that are laborious and time-consuming to set up but are totally worth the effort. And then this coming Sunday, I believe the video is... Uh, a video about games that are very easy to set up and why I enjoy um, why I enjoy those games. Um, among uh, Quack, Space Space, and Pendulum, the games that I played this past weekend, I also tried Arkham Horror, the Arkham Horror LCG pack for Murder at the Excelsior Hotel. I had played Arkham Horror LCG one other time, just the introductory game, and was kind of met on it, and so I wanted to give it another try after many people recommended revisiting to it, revisiting it. And so we tried this, uh, this highly acclaimed expansion that a number of people recommended on my YouTube channel. And uh, we played, 
I don't know, we played it for a couple hours. It took about an hour to learn and then played it for a couple hours. Um, and I'm still honestly a little bit on it. I understand that's a highly acclaimed game, but I just can't get past the, skill, the way the skill checks work in the game. It's a it's a kind of a, a random draw from a bag that you can mitigate with certain things, but you mitigate them before you know what you draw from the bag. And that's just not the type of skill check that I enjoy. The story and writing, though, is incredible. And the way that they use the components in different expansions is really, really cool. So I admire the game a lot. It's just not one that I'm going to return to. Um, yeah, so those are some of the, the games I've been playing. The blog post, what did I do? I did a blog post last week. A number of you mentioned that GameFound was announcing that they are going to have a tabletop Kickstarter-like platform, tabletop crowdfunding, crowdfunding platform. And I looked into that and did an article about that last week. And I also had an article a couple days ago about stretch goals. What happens in a project if you run out of stretch goals? Do you keep adding them? Do you cut it off? Or do you have a digital stretch goal that can be enhanced without impacting a budget or a time frame or schedule of your project. So I explained kind of the pros and cons of those different approaches. I will say that, that I don't miss stretch goals as a creator. Um, it's not something I really look for as a backer anymore in a project. I, I just want to get the, the complete version of, of the game, or not even the complete, but the best possible version of it. Um, and it, as a creator, I, I it always felt a little weird to kind of hold things back as stretch goals. I just want to put everything together and make make an awesome product for people. So I enjoy that I'm able to do that now that I don't use Kickstarter anymore. Ornani says, will there be anything Stomire related during Spiel Digital? Yes. Yeah, that actually ties into one of the other little things I wanted to cover today, which are recent videos that I filmed for other content creators. And one of them was for Asmodee Digital regarding Scythe Digital. So we filmed a video... Uh, this past Monday for that. So n nothing will come out directly about Stolmeyer. We don't have any announcements to make or anything like that, but you will see that video from Asmodee Digital. And then I'm doing a video with uh, Forland, our German partner, next, I think it's Friday. I think it'll be live next Friday um, during, during Spiel where people can ask questions. Let me get that right because just in case any of you want to tune into that, I'm looking at my calendar over here. Yes. One o'clock Central Time next Friday, October 23rd, I will join um, Inga at Thorland for a chat about Stolmeyer game stuff. Um, most of which I think Thorland has also partnered with us to publish in German in Germany. Ethan says, what are my thoughts on the list of side factions and which ones are outpower the others? Are you a fan of others publishing lists like that as a developer? I love when people create any content for our games or, or want to talk about strategy for our games, questions for our games, and really anything, the world of our games. I love seeing that. So I'm definitely not bothered by people publishing lists. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I'm totally fine with it. I, I understand that uh, there are some factions that in the hands of a very experienced player might play a little faster, might play a little objectively or subjectively better than, than another faction, or another combo, player map, faction map combo. Um, and I think that's kind of the fun of side that you have you have a lot of asymmetry. There's a lot of variability depending on the number of players that you're playing with, um, the, those combinations, the cards that you draw. Uh, I think there's a, a lot of replayability that comes from that. Scythe was not designed for tournament play, even though there have been some Scythe tournaments. Um, so even though we try to make Scythe as balanced as possible, I think it, it, it is not. It, you, you really need kind of the draft at the beginning of a tournament to help balance it in certain circumstances. Because uh, there are some factions that are have shown, I think, statistically to be slightly more powerful than others when combined with certain player mats. But that's not why I play Scythe. I, I think that's not why a lot of people play Scythe. They play to try different things. They, they try to win. I try to win when I play Scythe. But I also try to... I, I like the challenge of, of weird combinations. I don't like to pick what it, someone maybe publishes on a list as the best combination and just play with that. That to me is not as interesting as playing with a weird combination or a random combination and doing my best with that combination. Justin says, uh, do you often feel like you have an overbearing amount of work to get done at Stonemeyer? How do you deal with that? I've been feeling stressed with getting grad school applications done and setting up a presentation for a program I wrote. Stressful, but happy I have these things going for me. That is great that you have those things going for you, Justin. And I think that's one a positive way to look at it, that, uh, that if you're enjoying what you're doing and, um, and you are making progress, I think that's key to feel like you're making progress. And so one of the things that I do there is I, I have like a little sticky note of things that I want to accomplish every day. And it's not something I sit down and write at the beginning of the day. I kind of accumulate these things over the course of the day. 
Um, and it feels good to scratch things off that list. So sometimes that um, there, I have some very big projects that I'm working on and I try to break down on the, on the list. One thing that, that I want to get done today for one of those, those bigger picture projects. Um, and so if I can scratch off, well, I can't like scratch off an entire game that I'm working on, but if I can scratch off one task for that game, then I can feel like I made progress that day. Um, so that really helps me not feel overwhelmed. There certainly are days though, where I want to work say on game design for an hour or so, and it just doesn't happen because I have all this other operational stuff to deal with. But at the same time, I enjoy that operational stuff. And so I try to remind myself of that. Yeah, I didn't get to design any parts of a new game or a new expansion today, but I had fun doing this weird logistical thing, or I had fun helping a customer. That way I can get some gratification, some, satis some satisfaction out of, out of what I did that day, rather than look back and feel like I didn't do the one thing that I really wanted to get done. And if I did have, if I do have one thing that I really want to get done, I make it happen. I make time for it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I, I'll hold off on John's question for a second. Let me see if there's any. I don't have any urgent topics today. Oh, one other thing about Wingspan. I did post a poll about um, if we ever do a promo pack of uh, or promo packs of kind of offshoot birds, birds that don't fit into the model of continent by continent, or maybe they do and we miss them, uh, what people would be most interested in us making. And by far the top two vote getters were extinct birds and endangered birds. I think there are a few endangered birds in the Wingspan European expansion, or maybe that's the core game, one of the two, but, uh, but having a core pack that focuses on endangered, or not a core pack, a promo pack that focuses on endangered birds or extinct birds. So it's totally up to Elizabeth if we do that someday, but I, I think that data was helpful for her. And feel free, if you haven't responded to that poll, feel free to check out the Facebook group. I think the poll might still be at the top of the page, or maybe I took it down, but you can always look for, uh, maybe search for the word extinct and you might see the poll pop up in the Wingspan Facebook group. Okay, John says, what in your opinion should a first time creator expect to experience after their game gets into the hands of backers and enters the market properly versus being an upcoming Kickstarter project? Hmm, what to, let me try to understand the question here. What should a, a first time creator expect to experience after their game gets into the hands of backers? So you're saying, okay, so you did kickstart it and now backers are getting it and enters the market properly. What to expect? I don't know. It really depends on how well the game did and, and how uh, retailers are responding to it. Because retailers and distributors don't pick up many new games. There's so many games, especially coming off Kickstarter now, they have to be very selective about that. So I would keep your expectations low. Um, I don't know. It's hard to, to talk about what to expect uh, exactly. I, I like to talk about the things that you can control. And you, you can't really control... A lot of a lot of like how the game is received you can't control that uh, you can do you can do your best to make a beautiful game again that's well received but what you can control and i have an article about this is uh how to try to have your game launch with a boom um, when you've actually released it to the world other than just the kickstarter and this is one of the tricky things about kickstarter because it's really easy to get excited about a kickstarter project if it's going well in particular you're excited about it backers are excited about it but then you have that long wait before anything actually happens with it. And you can still build anticipation over that time, but it's almost like a sigh of relief when a backer finally gets the, the game um, rather than the same excitement that they experienced during the Kickstarter project. So I think the challenge that you face there, and my article talks about this a little bit, is actually getting backers to play the game once they get it. They're going to be excited to get it. They're probably excited to open it. But are they actually going to get up to the table and talk about it and share it with their friends and post pictures about, about it on Instagram? Are reviewers going to be excited to, to play it? Are you sending it to review reviewers and are they actually playing it? So rather than focus on maybe what to expect, I would focus on try, trying to use various techniques to help people, to encourage people to actually get it to the table. And I think a lot of that comes down to the community that you built around the game, community that is encouraging each other to be excited about it and actually play it. Uh, Bruno says, what would you, would you recommend mixing different language versions of Wingspan given that players are familiar with the languages being mixed. Yeah, sure, yeah, we're, we we handle all the manufacturing for all these different versions of the game, even though we aren't the translators for the game. And so we ensure that all the card stock is the same. You can definitely shuffle all the cards together and uh, that, that they're totally compatible with each other based on the components themselves. Andre says, are you going to make a birdless version of Wingspan? Most people I've played are either not interested in the theme or find hard or find it hard to connect the game, the theme to game mechanisms. 
as for the, the latter point, I'm a little surprised by that because I think Elizabeth did a fantastic job of tying uh, what each bird is in real life to the mechanisms on their card. So, and you can even, if you're maybe struggling to help people, help people make those connections, uh, maybe help them make those connections a little bit better because the connections are very strongly built into the theme. She didn't just design a, some random mechanisms and then slapped a bird theme on it. She, Elizabeth looked at every bird one by one and selected mechanisms that fit that specific bird. One thing you can do there is look at the facts, the bird facts at the bottom of the card. Oftentimes that helps players make the connection between uh, the theme for that specific bird and the mechanisms. As for are we gonna make a, a birdless version of Wingspan, the promo poll I posted in the Wingspan group indicated that a lot of people really are not interested in that, um, at least within the Wingspan world. I posted ideas for like dinosaurs, for, for aquatic creatures, for, um, for, for dragons, and people just didn't seem interested partly at all in that. However, that was a poll in the Wingspan group for people who love Wingspan in its current form. So it is possible one or more of those themes might be appealing to a lot of people who haven't given Wingspan a try. Um, so we don't have any plans. The poll indicated that they might not, might not be interested in it, but, um, but I'm still open to it. Let's see, Michael is joining us for the first time. And oh, Michael from Unfiltered Gamer. Good to have you, Michael. He says uh, uh, he's excited to launch his wife's game, Moonshell. Great name, a mermaid game next year. I hope that's going well. Michael included, it looks like a link to Moonshell. I love that name. Um, great name selection. I hope that goes well. I hope the, the playtesting for that game is going well, Michael. Let's see if I have any other random topics here. I do have a list of topics. Oh, yeah. Oh, I wanted to mention. So I, I have been on a few different um, podcasts recently where I've been talking with other people about games. One fun one was Board Game Babble with Berkey and Badger. I think we filmed that last week sometime. That was a great chat. We had a really a good time chatting. Uh, they have kind of a game show vibe to their channel. It's it's fun. It's very light. Um, and uh, it's not – you can participate as an audience member – even though you're not live because they, they like one of the things was they had me hold up some game components very close to the to the camera and they had to try to guess what game they're from. And so it's something that you can play along with even if you're watching the video after the fact. I also had a, a short chat with Jim from What Board Game. Um, he's Jim Gamer on Instagram. He had a, a wonderful uh, charity marathon this past Saturday where he played games for around 12 hours and raised money for a, a dementia charity that he's very passionate about. And so we did a thing where over the course of the weekend, if anyone used a promo code that Jim shared related to Stonemaier Games on our web store, uh, for everyone that used that promo code, we donated $5 to his dementia uh, charity of choice. So I think 12 people ended up using the code, so we donated $60 to that, that charity. And, oh, I want to mention this one because tomorrow I will be on the Covenant cast to talk about the impact of the COVID pandemic on the game industry. Um, and so I have some topics I'm definitely going to think about and I'm definitely going to cover. But if you have any thoughts about that, uh, not so much, if you want to answer about your, your personal impact, I'd be happy to hear that. But I'm most curious about your perception, perception of how COVID has impacted the industry as a whole or one specific part of the industry. Like game stores or, or, or gaming channels, review channels, or your Kickstarter habits, your buying habits, things like that. Um, so I guess it can be a little personal there, how, how it's impacted you. I'd love to hear your thoughts there in the comments, and I might take some of those thoughts to the podcast tomorrow. And last, oh, I had two other, uh, one other recording I did with uh, a guy named Vance who does a start, uh, not a startup, but kind of an entrepreneur, entrepreneurship business um, YouTube channel called Articulate Ventures. And he often talks, he talks to a bunch of random people, but his channel is mainly geared towards farmers. So it was interested to be invited to that, but it was just kind of a nice business chat. We talked about different aspects of the board game business and hopefully how they might apply to other businesses as well. So lots of different podcast chats over the last week. I think today is my one break from it a little bit. I do enjoy doing it, but um, yeah, none, none today. No, this is the only live cast that I'm doing today or recording that I'm doing today. Let's see, I'm looking through some uh, questions over here. Uh, Micah says, if I have Viticulture Essential Edition and Tuscany Essential Edition, is there expansion content missing that's still out there or is that all the content? No, there are two other, two other expansions, Micah. There's the, uh, the Visit from the Rhine Valley expansion, which uh, gives you all new visitor cards that actually replace the visitor cards 
if you're, so you can play with the normal visitor cards or the Rhine Valley visitor cards. And there's the more visitors pack, which are just more visitors that you can shuffle into your normal visitor card packs. They're both just tiny little expansions, very easy. I mean, you just take out the cards and shuffle them in essentially. Or for Rhine, you just take the cards out and play with them. Very easy to add to the game. Tim says, wife and I are going to a cabin in Richmond this weekend for our first trip without our three-year-old daughter. Um, we plan to play board games a lot along with enjoying the seclusion of the woods. What would you choose to play first out of Wingspan, Arkham Horror, Isle of Cats, Gloomhaven, and Call to Adventure? Any other suggestions? I'm definitely biased to Wingspan. I mean, Wingspan is definitely uh, my favorite on that list. I would say my top two favorites on that list are Wingspan and Isle of Cats. Uh, I, I really, really enjoy those games. Uh, if you want to be creeped out a little bit in the woods, you might go with something like Arkham Horror. There's also a game, uh, there's a hidden movement game, a really, really great hidden movement game that's based on like a, a cabin in the woods style horror. Oh, what is it? Um, someone might be able to help out in the comments here. It is a hidden movement game that I played a geek way years ago that is around that theme of, of a, kind of a, a cabin, a, a camp, a camp or cabin in the woods in a horror movie. Hopefully someone can remember that in the comments. Uh, I've heard great things about Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, especially the tutorial. I'm very curious about the tutorial. Gloomhaven itself isn't a game that I play very, very often at all, but, uh, but you know, I, I admire what Isaac has done with it. Call to Adventure, great kind of storytelling game. And yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would go, I mean, I would go with Wingspan and the Isle of Cats. Though. Those would be my picks if I were there in the cabin with you two. Ernani says, am I excited about any Spiel releases in particular? Yeah, I've been kind of keeping an eye on them on Board Game Geek. I mean, I'm, I'm excited about a number of them, really. But uh, Lost Ruins of Arnak looks really cool. I love deck building. I love exploration. So I'm, I'm curious to see what they did with that. And uh, Under Falling Skies has been getting has been on the hotness for a while now. So I'm at least curious about what that one is. Yeah, those are the main ones, I think, that I'm excited about. I'm sure there are many more that I just don't know about yet, though. Tim also says, would you ever be interested in developing a game based off a novel? Uh, yeah, I was for a long time. I was trying to do that for Red Rising. Um, what are some games that you enjoy that are based off books? And he, he mentions Call of, uh, Call of Two Adventure based off of Patrick Rothfuss's um, Name of the Wind series and Brandon Sanderson's uh, Cosmere Stormlight Archive uh, have also been in Call, of, Call to Adventure. Uh, what are some other games based on? I actually, I'm working on a list of games based on IPs for a video. Let me see what I have on the list so far. Uh, Game of Thrones is based on the novel series, but also kind of the TV show. Um, Dune, I haven't played Dune, but that's based on the novel. All the Marvel stuff is originally based off the, you know, the, the comic books. So that's, that's kind of, kind of related. The Hobbit, I played, I, I, I do enjoy Hobbit Love Letter. That's also kind of based off the, the, the novel, but also the, the, uh, the movies. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing a ton here. Unmatched, Unmatched does have some novel connections, but it's kind of based more towards the overall IPs. And Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective is kind of based off Sherlock. But I, there aren't a lot of games based specifically off of one specific novel at least that have done well to my knowledge. Feel free to mention more in the comments here because that is a video that I want to do. If you can think of any game that you really enjoy that's based off of a novel itself, not other parts of that IP, but the novel, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments here. Andrew says, have I read The Building Blocks of Tabletop Game Design Encyclopedia by Jeffrey Eggleston? Uh, Jeff, uh, I have not. No, I've read, I've read, I think I own it. I think I have it. I think I backed it, but I, I have not read it yet. Mark says that he's enjoying the modular board for Scythe. I'm always happy to hear that. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Pedro says, what can we expect for the Viticulture expansion? Yeah, I, I have hinted at in our e-newsletter that we are working on a Viticulture expansion, but at, right at this point, I'm just hinting at it. I'm not really talking about what it is yet because it can still evolve into something very different than what it is right now. Miles says that he played Alma Mater for the first time last last night. He said he had fun, but kept comparing it to Coimbra due to the art style, even though they are very different games. Um, that's interesting. He says, have you ever had a similar experience where, where an attempt to make games similar thematically or aesthetically actually hurt your experience of a new game? That's interesting, Miles. Um, 
because there are some companies that always use the same artist um, and some that don't. Oh, I can definitely, there are a few games that use, okay, I can think of one in particular. I don't know if I should name, well, okay, I'll say it here. Uh, I love the Euro art style in Terra Mystica. Um, I love how the artist, I, it just feels like a Euro game. Just the, I think that artist is kind of known, yeah, I'll look up his name to give him credit, because he's a wonderful artist in Terra Mystica. So the artist of Terra Mystica is uh, Dennis Lohausen. Now, I believe that Dennis also did Gaia Project. He did indeed. And while I think his art style is perfect for Terra Mystica, I don't know if it's perfect for a science fiction game, uh, or especially a game set in space. And so that's, Miles, the one thing that I can think of. I, I think this has happened before. Uh, I don't necessarily know if it's detracted from my experience of playing Gaia Project, even though I do vastly prefer Terra Mystica. Um, but I do, I... I, I I wonder if I would have preferred the if I would have enjoyed the art more for um, Guy Project if he had if they had used maybe a, a, a different artist that specializes in sci-fi rather than you know medieval Euro style games, medieval fantasy kind of look, yeah. Uh, let's see. Any other topics? I think I've covered all the topics that I wanted to, so I can just focus on questions for here on out. Oh, things that I'm working on. Actually, just off camera here, I had to move the table. I am playtesting a game that I'm working on. I'm doing some solo playtest right now. I mean, it's a multiplayer game, but I'm just trying to playtest it solo. I've been working on that one, some rapid iterations of it. I, I did a playtest yesterday, this morning, and I'll probably do another one this afternoon. And I am also working, I'm kind of working on three games right now one of which we'll be playtesting on Friday outdoors with the other members of my team here in St. Louis. And, uh, and I'm kind of popping in and out of another game that I'm working on. So some progress is being made on, on a few of our games and a few of our expansions are being playtested in blind playtesting stage right now. Rafal says, uh, two questions here. Do you play board games every day? And what do you do if I don't play games? I don't play games every day, no. I play games maybe two to three days a week. Um, games from other publishers. So every other week I host a, a game night on Wednesdays. It's been virtual for the last eight months. And we have another virtual game night on Thursdays. That's also been virtual for the last eight months. I have a game night every other Friday with another couple, also virtual, a lot of virtual gaming. And then Megan and I usually play maybe one or two games on the weekend, just two players in person. Uh, so I, I guess maybe uh, on any given week, it could be it could be up to five days a week but not every day, not quite every day. Rafal's other question, um, oh, and what do you, Rafal also says, what do I do if I don't play games? Usually I'm working. Um, I do take breaks for meals and we usually watch shows or movies during those breaks. Uh, at, at least at, at night we might watch something longer, during the day we watch something shorter during our lunch breaks. And um, otherwise I'm, I'm typically working. Uh, if I'm not working, I might be playing disc golf or lately, I mentioned earlier in the video, I have tried to get back into indoor rock climbing. I'm, I'm trying that um, as safely as I can. So uh, those are my, my two other kind of active hobbies right now that I, that I do. I also read at night. I, I, I love to read before I fall asleep. Where Fall's other question was, do you ever take breaks on purpose from playing games to get some rest? Not really, no. I might take breaks from different types of games. I do occasionally... I, don't try to, I, like one of Joe's responsibilities at my company is actually to learn games and to help me learn those games. Because one of the things that I don't like spending a lot of time on is going through rule books and learning games. I do it sometimes because I like to learn from other rule books and I need to be able to have that skill, retain that skill. But uh, it is so time consuming at times that it is nice that if I have a more complex game, I can just say, Joe, I'd love for you to teach me this game and we can play it together and hopefully have a good time with it. Tyler says, are there plans for Scythe expansions to be, uh, to be, other than the additional players? Uh, I'll clarify Tyler's question here a little bit. He says, are there plans for the other Scythe expansions to appear on the digital platforms? Um, currently, Scythe is available on Steam, iOS, and Android, I believe, the full AI version of, of Scythe. It is a game controlled by the Knights of Unity and Asmodee Digital, the digital version is. And... Uh, so far, they have one expansion, Invaders from Afar. I would love for them to add the Wind Gambit, the Maldra the Board, Scythe Encounters, and the Rise of Fenris. 
And I, my perception is that they want to do those things too, but they're taking it one step at a time. So I don't really know if they are even working on any of those other ones yet or what they will focus on when they do. Andrew says, do I think, do I think that Wingspan has turned more board gamers into birders or more birders into board gamers? I would probably say more birders into board gamers, but it is neat that it might make gamers a little bit more aware of birds. It certainly has had that impact on me. Like last year when we went to New Zealand, uh, it was not related to the Oceania expansion at all. We just wanted to go to New Zealand because it's beautiful, or we heard it's beautiful, and it actually is. And we paid a lot of attention to the birds while we were there because of, of Wingspan. Last Friday, okay, Jazz came through with the name of the game that I was trying to think of. Last Friday is uh, the, the Hidden Movement game that I was trying to talk about. One of my favorite Hidden Movement games. It's a wonderfully thematic Hidden Movement game. Brist says, what is my take on the missing pieces components policy from different publishers? I like our policy, which is that if you have a missing or broken component, just fill out our replacement parts form and we will send it to you. Uh, that is my preferred policy as, as a publisher and as a gamer, although I understand that other publishers have different circumstances. Um, but that's, yeah, that's, I, I, think that's, I think that's just good customer service, really. If someone has a broken part, that you, that you replace it. Or especially if it's missing. If it's missing from the game, yeah, definitely. I mean, they bought the game for that component. The one exception there, I would say, is if it is a component that is really not necessary. Like, if you include 100 coins in the game and no one ever uses actually uses 100 coins, you just had room on the punch board for 100, 100 coins, uh, and one of those coins is missing, it, it, it is just kind of an environmental waste to request that part. Because you're having someone put, like, one little cardboard core in, in an envelope and sending it however knows how, how far across the world to get it to you. Um, that used to be annoying to me when I paid attention to replacing parts. Now I have Joe handle that system. So, and Joe and our, our helpers around, around the world handle that system. So I don't know if they get annoyed when someone does that, when someone requests a piece like that, but uh, it does happen from time to time. And I'd ask you as fellow gamers that if you ever do, if you are missing a token that really, really is not necessary in a game, don't ask for a replacement part for it. Or not for some of our games, for any company, um, because it does have an environmental impact when someone has to ship a tiny little cardboard component that you're never gonna use because you're never gonna use that hundredth coin in the game um, halfway across the world. So I wouldn't, I think if you wanna think about that a little bit, think about the environmental impact when you do re re request a replacement part. But if it is something that you actually use in the game, like a torn, if you have a torn card in Wingspan, you need that, that's an important thing. Um, Request it. Let us know. We will. We are happy to replace it. Rafal says, how would you define what a fun game is for me? And how do you respond to people who criticize playing board games on apps or board game arena? Uh, totally different questions here, but good questions, Rafal. I like this. Uh, actually, it is it's really hard to define what a fun game is for me. Um, I could break it down into like interesting decisions, games where I have agency control over, over my choices. Um, games with, with uh, moments that make me smile. But in the end, it's a feeling. And I think it is different for every player. But when I sit down to ha and I'm playing a game, I, it's just a feeling I, I can experience. Am I having fun with this or not? And it's something that I really try to pay attention to, pay attention to when I'm playing Destiny game. I may have designed a game that has plenty of interesting decisions and is functional, it's balanced, but it still may not be fun. And I've played plenty of games from other publishers that check all those boxes, but I don't have fun playing them. Um, and so I really try to pay attention to that when I'm playtesting our games. When is that moment that the game is fun? And what are the little moments that are particularly fun in the game? And how can I really highlight those moments and, make, and boost them and make them a bigger part of the game so players can have that fun? And I'm also paying attention when I do these playtests to other players. What are they having fun with? And when are they not having fun? When are they distracted? When are they on their phones instead of immersed in the game? Your other question is, how do you respond to people who criticize playing board games on apps or board game arena? Um, you know, people have different preferences of playing games. I totally understand. I mean, I, I miss playing games in person so much, but I am grateful for Board Game Apps and Board Game Arena for letting me play games virtually and have close to that gaming experience without playing in person. I have nothing to say to people who criticize it other than if you haven't tried it, give it a try and then criticize it. Be well informed before you actually criticize something. It's like someone who criticizes a movie without actually watching it. Like, you, you got to take that with a grain of salt. Uh, if they haven't actually watched it. 
Uh, Connor says, do not mix Isle of Cats with Wingspan. That is a great pro tip there, Connor. I totally agree. Tim says, did I see the new Expanse trailer coming in December? You know, Tim, I, I stopped watching the Expanse show. I love the books, the Expanse series. And actually, that's a great pick for, for a board game. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, Tim. Um, board games that have, or IP, IPs that have turned into games. The Expanse is a great example. Great game. But no, I love the books, but I just really just didn't get into the show enough to sustain me. As good of a show as it is, I think it's a great translation of the books into an on-screen format. But I just enjoy the books more. I think I found, I found the show a little slow, actually. Steiner says, do I know if Monster Couch is already working on the European expansion for Wingspan Digital? Uh, they are not, uh, because I'm waiting for them to release the game, as they should have a while ago, on iOS and Android and Switch. So I am holding that those files back from them actually right now because I, I love what they did, what they've done with the game, but um, they, I just need them to get it out there on those other formats. And once they do, I'm happy to give them the European files so they can start working on that. So no, I know that might sound a little bit bad, but I, they were, this was a game that they were supposed to release back in the spring. And I know it would have brought people so much joy to have that game in the spring. And it kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed. I, I appreciate that they're trying to make the game as good as possible, but um, they, they, I don't know, they just need to get it out there more than just the Steam format. Keith mentioned The Reckoners is another IP game. Yes, great pick there. The Reckoners. And I'll mention Call to Adventure. I'm adding these to my list of top games based on IPs or novels or things like that. Nathan says, the only game I played based on a book is The Scarlet Pimpernel and the Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. The Princess Bride was a book before it was a movie. Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Definitely got to add that. Do I have that on my list already? No, I don't have. Somehow I missed Harry Potter on my little list here. Got to put that on there. I do actually really enjoy Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Thank you all for these suggestions. Brist says, do I have any non Stomeyer favorite board game covers? I think you mean like the box cover? Yeah, well, I love so many different box covers. Um, I'm looking at my shelf over here to see if I have any particular favorites on the shelf. Flip Ships, I think that I love the Flip Ships artist. I, and I, I think that's a fantastic box. Um, Spirits of the Forest, I think the art direction at Thunder Griff is excellent. Great box there. Uh, what are some boxes? I, I mean, I, I love a lot of the art that I'm looking at over here, but I'm looking at boxes that, that really pop for me. I'm seeing a lot of good boxes, but maybe not a lot of, maybe not great boxes. Let me look on Board Game Geek real quick to see if there's any that jump out. Looking at the thumbnails and the hotness to see if anything. Marvel Champions, the card game, does have a great box. I, I think it looks exciting and engaging. Um... Any others that jump out? Ter uh, Terraforming Mars, actually, I really love the box. It looks epic and cool. Um, I don't necessarily think the, the art in the game matches that, but but the box, I, I like the box a lot. The brass box, that was Brass Birmingham, yeah, awesome box on brass. Um, any others here? Nemesis has a really cool box. I'm surprised Nemesis got away with, with that box without uh, having any IP infringement, but hats off to them for, for pulling that off. Still need to play a Nemesis. Um, yeah, those are the ones. Oh, Everdell. Everdell does have a really, really beautiful... Oh, man, I, I got to bring it up on the screen because it just looks so good. The lighting... This is what made me want to work with Andrew Bosley for, for Tapestry. It's just a... Like, you just look at that Everdell box, and I'm like, I, I want to walk into that world. I want to be in that world for a little while. Fantastic job on the lighting on, on, on the Everdell box. That's a fun question. Um, Connor says, what is one popular mecha uh, mechanic or mechanism and one popular theme that you will never use in a Stillmire game design? It's hard for me to really say never, Connor. Um, I mean, zombies are one of the themes. Zombies and trains are two themes that come to mind that I probably won't use. But as I say that, I'm, I'm wondering if the zombies have appeared anywhere in our games. I don't think they have. Uh, but those are two themes that I enjoy in games. I, I am happy to play those games, but I don't think I'd put them into a Stillmire game. Um, unless it was like a zombie faction in, in Tapestry. That would be cool, actually. Should have a zombie faction in Tapestry. Uh, and one popular mechanism 
that I may not use. Take that is something. And I do have like very minor elements of take that in a few of our games. And, uh, but it's, it's a mechanism that I just generally do not enjoy and, and generally want to stay away from. Yeah. Anything that really targets a specific other player. And there's even a card in Viticulture that does that. And I don't love that the card is in the game, the, the queen card. Uh, Jonathan says uh, he wishes he was able to copy edit the, the pendulum rule book and fix the problems he found ahead of time. I'd be curious to hear those problems, um, Jonathan. Yeah, I actually got some feedback from, okay, well, I won't go into that here. I, I, we, we got some feedback from, feedback from Paul Grogan about the rule book, and I was expecting it to be like big things that we, we totally missed, but they were really minor things, and he even missed one of the things where he added something that was in that same paragraph that was already right there. Um, but he says, can I get into on, in on your next project and do some technical edit, editing and help them be the best they can be? You know, I love that. I, 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 I think we do a great job with our rule books, but they can always be better. So sure, Jonathan. Yeah. Contact me at Jamie at stillmarigames.com and I'm happy to have you help out with the next project. And we're always, we, we, we reprint many of our games on an ongoing basis. And so if you see things in our existing rule books that, that you think should be better, feel free to let me know about that as well. And we can, we can tweak that. Um, yeah. Chad says, other than disc golf, have I been trying to learn any new skills? Um, not really. Not, not, not big skills. Disc golf, rock climbing. Uh, I'm always trying to be a better cook. So that's something that's kind of an ongoing basis thing. Yeah. I have learned how to make coffee fairly recently. I didn't know how to do that before. Let's see. Um, David says, just a heads up that the crew is now available on Board Game Arena. Yes, yeah, we actually played that at Board Game Night. Um, actually, twice over the last two weeks we played board, on Board Game Arena. It's a really nice implementation. I do miss a, a few of the elements of, of the tabletop version in terms of the timing of when you can commun communicate things to other players. But um, but it is a overall, it's a good implementation, I think. Let's see. Pedro says he started he started playing Scythe on the iPad. Is it the same rules as the board, or as, as the tabletop version, or are there some differences? As far as I know, it should be the exact same rules as the tabletop version. Um, and I think sometimes people discover while playing the digital version that they've been playing something wrong in the tabletop version. You can always check in the Scythe face, Facebook group if you experience that. But I am ninety nine point nine percent sure that the rules are correct in the digital version. Zach says, do you think you'll ever fully retire from Stillmire Games years down the road? I, I, I think so eventually, yeah. Um, I, I don't really know what retirement will look like for me. I, I think I, I will still have to be creatively create, uh, uh, creating something. Um, that, that's, that's what gives me some of the best satisfaction, the best moments that I have. I don't think I'd be happy just sitting around consuming content. I, I feel the need to create content, even if it's just for myself at that point. Um, but yeah, I'm 39 right now. So I, I, I'm I, hopefully I've got another like, what, 40 years left in me. I don't know if I will run Stonemaier Games for 40 years, but for the foreseeable future, yeah, I hope to continue doing that. Marcel has a nice thank you for my help provided to board game designers and Kickstarter related and otherwise. Thank you, Marcel. That's nice of you to chime in and say. Tim mentioned that the Shining and Jaws are, ba are based off movie or based off movies based off of books, and there's also plenty of games based off of H.P. Lovecraft stories. That is true. Yeah. Oh yeah. I have the, I have that on my on my list. I haven't played Jaws, so I can't put that on the list. But I have heard good things about that. The Jaws board game. Marcel says, not sure if asked already, but what do you expect of next week's Spiel Digital? I don't know much about what to expect. I, it's just kind of the games that I've seen on the Board Game Geek Hotness that I think are coming out then. Um, but I am curious to see what... I, I'm always kind of looking at what reviewers say about these games. So I'm excited for them to get in the hands of reviewers. And if there are any... Usually there's some fun, unexpected reveals at Spiel. So I'm excited to see what, what that kind of stuff is. Um, I don't stay too... like. I, while I follow conventions a little bit and I follow what people are excited about at conventions, um, that is a world that is still somewhat foreign to me. It is not, conventions are not a big part of Stillmeyer Games or a big part of what I follow. 
Tim says there's a Battlestar Galactica game. I think I had that on my list. Yeah, I, I do have that on my list. And Star Wars and Star Trek. Yes, I've got Star Wars. I don't know if I played a Star Trek game. There are Star Trek games, of course, but I don't think I've played any of them. Yeah, I'm much more of a Star Wars guy. Bruce says, any gaming plans for Halloween Day? Uh, they personally plan on playing Dead of Winter. Yeah, Dead of Winter is a good idea for Halloween. We should try to pull that out and make that happen. I, ha I have that on a shelf. I haven't played it in a long time, so I might need to find someone who has played it more recently to give that a try. You know, we might try to play, you know, a, a slightly scary game for Halloween. Currently, we don't have any plans, though. Uh, Joe says, I mentioned a, a GIS project a few weeks ago. I'm now in the data collection phase. Any recommendation on a good location to solicit gamers to answer an online survey? I would try Board Game Geek and maybe the Board Game Geek Facebook group. I think both are, are good places to find gamers. Tim mentions Legendary Encounters Alien as a great IP game, and I totally agree. That is, yeah, absolutely. Um, I had forgotten that one as well. Tim, you're, you were awesome. Anyone who suggested these IP games, uh, these are fantastic suggestions. Mike says, zombie trash. I should just combine these two uh, themes that I'm not going to use in games, zombies and trains, into one faction for tapestry, a zombie train faction. That actually sounds kind of awesome. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Um, Sean says, in Tapestry, the Tapestry card that allows you to topple three territories is a take-that mechanism. It happened in a recent play and really hurt the appearance, experience of the, of the attacked player. Uh, topple three territories. Yeah, I can kind of see that. I, I think the, uh, I mean, in Tapestry, there is the element of a direct interaction on the map. I think you're opting into that if you play Tapestry, that your stuff might get toppled at some point. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry that it hurt the experience of that player. That was not the intention of that, of that card, for sure. Uh, and, of course, I think the nice thing about that we don't really, that I don't design take that games, is that if there are cards like that in the game, if, if you played that card, you can just remove that from the game. If you didn't have a good experience with that card or the queen card in Viticulture, just remove it. Don't play it with it again. You still have plenty of cards that you can still have the full experience of the game with. David says, do I know the Canadian retail release date for plans and ploys? Uh, it's the same everywhere. The same release date is October 30th is the worldwide release date for Tapestry Plans employees. So coming up real soon, just two weeks away. And thank you for supporting your local store. Tony says, it's almost that time. What? Oh, I haven't done chocolate of the, of the day. I forgot about that as well. Uh, chocolate of the day today. Uh, I'm, actually, I have cupcakes today. So I'm going to have a chocolate cupcake after lunch today or part of one. That'll be my chocolate of the day. Tony says, what game or item should absolutely be on my Christmas list? He already owns all of Stillmire games and hopefully all related accessories and expansions to our games. You know, I haven't done... I, later this year, I will do kind of my top games of 2020. Let's see if there's any on, that, on this list that really jump out. Uh, the crew has gone up and down. Uh, the crew will be on that list. I don't know where it will be. I love Shards of Infinity. That's been that's going to go on the list. I love Cats as a 2020 game. And Watergate... Um, Glenmore 2 will be on there, and Azul Summer Pavilion will be on there. So I don't know if that, that's more than one game. It really depends on your gaming preferences and what you enjoy, but those are some that are going to be on my end of the year list and that I'll be recommending to other people. Patrick says, one problem I have with some board games is griefing. I'm not familiar with that term. One player can take you out and keep you from being competitive, or players can gang up on you. Do you consider this at all while developing games? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I've seen that happen a few times. Um, most notably in... Uh, oh, I'm blanking on the name of the game. It's a... F I, I can find it on Board Game Geek. Uh, I will find it. It's, I won't name the game. But there is a game where, you can, where that can definitely happen. And that was something I really paid attention to in Scythe. And of course in Tapestry, since there's a map as well. But it's very difficult to do it in Tapestry. But in Scythe, yeah, I really wanted to prevent players from encouraging players in any way mechanically to gang up on one player uh, or, from, or from taking a player out of the game entirely. I think though, so I want to design mechanisms in any game that, that prevents and highly discourages players from doing that. At the same time, uh, players have a choice there to do that or not do that. Um, and if you are playing with people who somehow get joy out of ganging up on someone else or making someone, forcing someone out of a game. or uh, they, That's just not the type of people that I want to play with, ultimately. So um, I think there are two elements of that. There's the game design element, but there's also the human side, who you choose to play games with. 
Briss says, how often do you sit down and write an article about the gaming industry? I write articles twice a week on the Stonemaier Games blog. Uh, they're not about the gaming industry specifically, even though they often do use gaming examples, but they are about uh, entrepreneurship and startups and running a business and crowdfunding. And so I do that twice a week on the Stonemaier Games blog on Monday and Thursday. Michael has a suggestion for the zombie trains faction of Tapestry. When you conquer a territory, you may upright one of your toppled outposts. You do not topple out outposts when you conquer territories. If two players have upright out out outposts in a territory, they share control of the territory. During incomes turn income turns two through four, score your controlled territories. Flavor text, woo woo brains. Michael, you're brilliant. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm impressed that you came up with that so quickly. That's really, really good. <laughs> Zach says, are there any types of gaming tables and chairs that you would highly recommend? I have a table from Board Game Tables, and I really enjoy it. It has a, I think my favorite feature in it is the three-part topper, which makes it really easy for one person to take off the topper on top of the table. As for gaming chairs, I have a weird chair that I enjoy. I think it's good for, for balance. I'll try, I'll try to hold it up here. Um, it is a chair from, it, so it's a, a weird, like, balance-style chair. Definitely not a gaming chair. Definitely not as comfortable as gaming chairs, but it kind of keeps me on my feet while I work, so that uh, so that I'm not uh, letting my ba my body body go stagnant as I as I work. But I don't have like a fancy gaming chair. I know Justin does. I don't know if Justin's still here, but I've seen Justin's gaming chair on camera on the the Room Fifty One uh, video cast. So Justin might have a suggestion there. Uh, Chris says his favorite IP game is Star Wars Outer Rim. I haven't played that yet, but uh, but thanks for mentioning it. He says it opened my eyes to the pick up deliver genre of board games. You know, I need to try that because pick up and deliver is a, is a mechanism that I generally stay away from. It it isn't exciting for me, but if Outer Rim does it well, I, I need to try it. I've also heard pretty good things about um, the missions, the pick up deliver element of the Firefly board game, which is another one that I really want to try. Tom highly recommends, uh, it looks like Star Trek Ascendancy. Um, cool, yeah, it is a longer comment there about it, but uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I have heard good things about that. And David also mentions the, the Game of Thrones board game. Yeah, so thank you for these IP suggestions. If you can think of any after you're watching this or if you're watching this on YouTube, just post them in, in the YouTube comments of the, this version of the, uh, of that YouTube version of this video. And uh, I will pick them up for my top 10 games based on IPs that I'll make in a few weeks. And I think that's it for today. I've covered all my topics. It uh, looks like we have, uh, actually, I should mention Firefly. I, I should add that to my list here. Firefly. Even though I haven't played, have I played a Firefly themed game? I don't think I have yet, but I need to. Yeah. But yeah, thank you for your suggestions here. And um, yeah, I will see you next Wednesday. Have a wonderful Wednesday, a wonderful week, and I'll see you next week. Take care. Bye.